Mr. Mr. Dark Skin Sam is my neighbor. Hey, man. Look, man, y'all see what we got right there, man. We bringing more and more of this type of video. I'm not gonna lie. I saw this video on the internet and I saw the title. And it was eye-catching, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, and I was like, okay, kids? All right, okay, we got to see this, Most bro. feared kid in U.S. prison. That's crazy. 2024 update. So we about to see what it's about. Yes, so sir. Let's get right into it. Let's get into it, man. It might seem logical to assume that only adults are capable of committing heinous crimes, but children can be equally susceptible to acts that shock and horrify. Oh, so this, this little man right here did it. Oh, I don't know. I remember, to a killer yeah. couple boasting about their recent murder on YouTube, to two brothers slaughtering family members with knives for internet fame. These are some of the most feared young kids in U.S. prisons. Let's begin with T.J. Lane. First on the list Damn. is a killer whose seemingly innocent appearance masks the true monster lurking there. I remember this dude. Yeah. And it was laughing? Yeah. On February 27th, 2012, the small town of Chardon, Ohio, was plunged into tragedy when a high school shooting carried out by T.J. Lane left the community reeling. Lane, a 17-year-old student at Lake Academy Alternative School, entered the Chardon High School cafeteria that morning wearing a sweatshirt with killer written on it and armed with a 22 caliber handgun. The shooting began just as students gathered before classes started. Without a word, Lane opened fire, aiming directly at a table where a group of students were seated. In a matter of moments, Three students were fatally wounded, 16-year-olds Daniel Palmator and Demetrius Hewlin, and 17-year-old Russell King Jr. Additionally, three other students were injured, one of whom suffered permanent paralysis. Lane yeah. was not a stranger to the students at Chardon High School, as he had attended the school before transferring to the alternative education program. The motive behind his violent actions remained largely unclear, though some reports suggested he felt victimized or ostracized. The response to the shooting was swift. A teacher chased Lane out of the school, and he was later apprehended by authorities authorities near his car parked about a mile away from the scene. Subsequent investigations revealed that Lane had stolen the gun used in the shootings from his uncle. During his trial, Lane's demeanor was notably defiant and disturbing. He appeared in court wearing a t-shirt with the word killer scrawled across it, which he had written himself. He smirked and made obscene gestures to the families of the victims, showing no remorse for his actions. In March 2013, Lane was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Did he break out? September 11th, yeah. 2014, yeah. Lane, accompanied by two other inmates, broke out of the Allen Correctional Institution in Lima, Ohio. This situation was particularly alarming given Lane's criminal history. For hours during the manhunt, he was nowhere to be found until he was apprehended. He looked grown in that later. picture. In March 2016, amidst old. heightened security concerns, Lane was transferred to the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility in Lucasville, a fortress-like maximum security prison designed Aye. to house the most dangerous inmates. A friend of Lane spoke with CNN, describing him as just a very normal teenage boy and expressed being in complete shock over the recent incident. She noted that although Lane often appeared sad, he seemed otherwise normal in his daily behavior. Another friend shared insights into Lane's school life, revealing that he was regularly teased by his peers. This bullying led Lane to put a wall around himself, making him reluctant to share personal details or open up about his experiences. But these accounts raise a critical question. Can the difficulties Lane faced at home and the bullying justify his actions? Alyssa Bustamante. That's crazy. Have you ever seen anything like this? I never have, and I hope never to see another case. In a chilling episode that shook the nation, Alyssa Bustamante, a 15-year-old from Missouri, became infamously known as the Missouri old. teen thrill killer. Her heinous act involved the calculated murder of her nine-year-old neighbor, Elizabeth yeah. Alton. Alyssa Bustamante appeared to be an ordinary teenage girl, but her internet persona revealed a far darker side. <sighs> this hidden darkness erupted on October 21st, 2009, when Bustamante man. lured her nine-year-old neighbor, Elizabeth Alton, into the woods. There, she strangled the young girl, slit her throat and stabbed her in the chest with a kitchen knife. After the murder, Alyssa buried Elizabeth's body in a shallow grave she had hand dug behind pause, their Pause, pause. Okay, this okay, okay. Let's get this. This is not a regular 15-year-old. There's no way a 15-year-old is doing this. Nah, this is a 50-year-old, my guy. It's 50 in the head. See, yes, that's what I'm saying. Kill she the kid. 50 in the head, bro. This is not 50. Dig the damn grave. Flip the number back with 51, my guy. Put it in. When you watch this shit, crime documentaries and you watch all these killers and shit and you watch some movies and hair scary movies bro you learn that shit at such a young age it's not really hard to put two and two together nigga nigga you even do that shit with animals if, if your animal dies you bury it she probably was like 
I, I, I don't know what I don't the know fuck what made her kill a fucking kid. Like, what the fuck drove you to that point? But Oh, my God, bro. Brutal act seemed to be a manifestation of Alyssa's most horrific fantasies. Her public MySpace and YouTube profiles disturbingly listed killing people and cutting as her hobbies, See? hinting at the violent thoughts she harbored. On the day of the murder, Alyssa recorded in her journal, revealing her homicidal thoughts and expressing a chilling curiosity about what it felt like to take a life. She wrote, I just killed someone. I strangled them and slit their throat and stabbed them. Now they're dead. I don't know how to feel ATM. It was amazing. As soon as you get over the oh my god, I can't do this feeling. It's pretty enjoyable. I'm kind of nervous and shaky though right now. Okay, I gotta go to church now. LOL. On the evening of October 21st, 2009, after Patty Price reported her daughter, Elizabeth Alton, missing, police launched an urgent search. The investigation soon led to Alyssa Bustamante's home, where interviews with her family and the discovery of her journal containing incriminating details pointed to her involvement. Confronted with her journal entry, during a rigorous interrogation, Bustamante was pressured into confessing to the crime. She tried to play innocent at first, but then the police told her that they'd found the journal. We have your diary. We read your diary. Including the last entry. When pushed a little harder and having nowhere to go, she initially admitted it was an accident. But it all didn't last long, as she confessed to digging the hole five days prior to Elizabeth's death. Then the investigator pointed out that an autopsy she would reveal exactly how Elizabeth died. He pressed her further by asking, "How did she kill her?" To which Alyssa made the confession. I, yeah, At her 2012 trial, Alyssa Bustamante, tried as an adult, despite a turbulent childhood, pled guilty to second-degree murder to avoid a life sentence without parole. Second-degree, nigga, that's first. Parole after 30 nigga, she planned that shit. An additional conviction for armed criminal action means that even if she secures parole in 2024, she faces another 30 years, pushing her earliest possible release to 2054 at the age of 60. The next killer kid is that fucking bitch. Lionel Tate. I'll release her, Two bro. children are left alone to play and a six-year-old girl ends up dead. Was this merely a case of child's play gone horribly wrong, or was there something more sinister at work? On July 28, 1999, in Broward County, Florida, 12-year-old Lionel Tate found himself with his six-year-old cousin, Tiffany Eunuch. That day tragically ended with an event that would see Tate become the youngest American ever sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Oh, my God. On that evening, while Kathleen Grosset Tate was resting upstairs, she left Tiffany Eunuch in the care of her son, Lionel Tate. Shortly after, Tate alerted his mother that Tiffany was not breathing. Investigation later revealed that the child displayed severe bruises and injuries akin to a vehicular impact, including a fractured skull, a broken rib, and internal hemorrhaging. Tate, however, claimed God the injuries damn. resulted from imitating wrestling moves. During the trial, Tate's defense presented the argument that Eunuch's death was a tragic accident, suggesting that the 12-year-old, who weighed 170 pounds, was merely attempting to imitate wrestling moves of his television heroes with Tiffany, who weighed just 48 pounds. Bruh. However, their defense failed to sway the jury. In January 2001, when Tate was only 13 years old, he was convicted of first-degree murder. I was the 11. Law, Tate was convicted of first-degree murder without the jury needing to believe he intended to harm. The law stipulates that knowingly committing an act likely to injure a child resulting in death qualifies as child abuse and triggers the felony murder rule. During sentencing, Judge Joel T. Lazarus outlined that this rule applied even without proof of Tate's intent to kill or awareness of the potential for harm. He even went on to say that the decision was not entirely his to make. Consequently, Tate was sentenced to life in prison without oh, the necessity of prosecution to demonstrate his intent or understand oh, the consequences of his actions. Understandably, the sentence sparked controversy given that Tate was only 12 years old at the time of the murder, while his victim was just six years old. Eventually, he did that to a six year old. In 2004, by an appeals court that found his mental competency hadn't been properly assessed before trial. Consequently, Tate was released from prison under a plea agreement in January 2004, which involved him admitting to second-degree murder in exchange for one year of house arrest and ten years of probation. Although this marked a new beginning for Tate, then 16, his legal troubles continued. In 2005, he faced charges of armed robbery and a probation.
probation violation in 2006 led to his return to prison. On February 19, 2008, Lionel Tate entered a no-contest plea to robbery charges and received a 10-year sentence to be served in state prison. This sentence was set to run concurrently with a 30-year sentence he received for violating his probation. Currently, Tate is serving his time at the Charlotte Correctional Institution. Yeah, some Denver niggas Charlotte. just can't stay out of this jail, bro. This case is recognized as the deadliest act of crime and mass That's murder wrong. in Broken Arrow, often referred to as the Bever Family Massacre. What I'm <sighs> about to share with you will send chills down oh, the spine. Sad, For the Bever brothers, the pursuit of becoming famous drove their insane actions. Detective Rihanna Russell, who interviewed the younger brother Michael, reported, they wanted to kill at least 50 people. They wanted to be famous. They wanted a Wikipedia page. They wanted media coverage. Unfortunately, the tragic series of events began on the evening of July 27th. 2015 in their home in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Robert D., aged 18, and Michael, aged 16, had secretly amassed a collection of knives, which they used to attack their family members. The horrifying ordeal started when Michael deceitfully drew his sister into a bedroom under the pretense of showing her something on a computer. Robert then ambushed her, severely wounding her by slashing her throat and stabbing her multiple times. The disturbance alerted their mother, April, aged 44, who was brutally attacked oh by God. Robert. She suffered at least 48 knife wounds upon confronting him and died on the spot. The brothers continued their violent spree from room to room. Their father, David Bever, 52, endured 28 stabbings and numerous blunt force traumas. Their youngest brother, Christopher, just seven, received six stab wounds. The brothers then attacked their sister, Victoria, 18, stabbing her 18 times across her neck, chest, back, and upper arm. Amidst the bloody chaos, Daniel, 12, managed to lock himself in a room and call 911 for help. However, he was tricked into opening the door by Michael who acted as a victim himself. Once inside, the brothers stabbed Daniel nine times. Daniel's quick thinking and call for help played a crucial role oh, in saving fuck, his bro. sisters Autumn, aged two, and Crystal, aged 13. As police oh, quickly arrived God. at the scene, the brothers fled through the back of the house but were soon located by a police canine in a wooded area nearby. And then, Crystal Bever, a survivor of the Bever family massacre, identified her older brothers Robert and Michael as the perpetrators, leading to their charges of five counts of first-degree murder and Why? Oh, your whole family? To, to which they pleaded not guilty. In 2016 and 2018, Robert and Michael Beaver were convicted on all counts for the Bever family massacre, receiving multiple life sentences. Robert was sentenced to life without parole, while Michael, due to his younger age, received life sentences with possible parole, though his release is highly improbable. Heavenly Arroyo. Now let's look at the case. So these niggas went around just door to door. Bro, you tricked your little brother. Like, yo, I ain't gonna lie. Nah, these are demons, nigga. Nah, like, that's yeah. not even like. That is not those normal, Those are bro. not humans, bro. Bro, yeah. you are possessed. It's like, nigga, something dead ass was not like. Something went, but like. Like, uh, your family. Like, what did they do, bro? Your, bro, your little brother, bro. Your sister, your mom, your dad. Bro, and if the the boy did not call the police, bro, they would have smacked the yeah, two Yeah, they would have killed all of them. All of them, bro. And then the boy, they played victim and fucking the boy opened the door and they killed his ass too. Oh, my God. Like, I just don't see, like, I just be looking at people. I'm like, bro, how can you do that shit, bro? Like, it's not a, it's not a normal human behavior, bro. Nigga, dad, they're with, they're like, like, nigga, how do the parents not like see something going on with these niggas, man? That's like that, saying. that's something you have to like really, like. There's no way you don't catch that shit. But that's like, crazy. How do you miss those signs, bro? Like, that's what I'm saying. It, 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 bro, it gotta be some demon. They probably got possessed or some shit. Yeah, they, no, they, but like they, they, something they, that they were planning though. It's like nigga, they wanted to be famous. For I mean, they got they got famous for damn sure. But like, nigga. You, bro, what the fuck? Your whole family, nigga, you ain't, you, you not love your, you don't love nobody here, man? People are crazy. Though his release is highly improbable. Heavenly Arroyo. Now let's look at the case of a 15-year-old girl who ended the life of Ana Vasquez Rodriguez in a barbaric manner. Arroyo, who had recently moved into her great uncle's home on Johnson Street, was living there with Ana Vasquez Rodriguez and her grandson. The house, where tensions were already high, became the site of a violent crime. 
On October 6, 2019, Arroyo's great uncle had planned a trip to New York to secure legal documents for her custody, but was delayed due to car troubles, causing Arroyo significant frustration and agitation as the day went on. Arroyo, unable to contain her growing impatience, took a pair of scissors from the kitchen and entered Ana Vasquez Rodriguez's bedroom, where she unleashed a brutal attack, stabbing the bedridden 68-year-old woman 70 times. At the time of this horrific 70 act, times. the only other person present in the house was the victim's grandson, who was playing a video game wearing a headset, completely unaware of the tragedy unfolding. Oh, After the murder, good. Arroyo took a shower, discarded her blood-stained clothes in a nearby dumpster, and then coldly informed the grandson that his grandmother was unwell. Discovering the horrible reality, the grandson immediately dialed 911, and police swiftly arrived at the scene. The breakthrough in the investigation came when video surveillance footage provided by the Fall River Housing Authority showed Arroyo disposing of the clothes, contradicting her initial claim that she was outside with the dog and had seen well, the last not night. get away with Once shit, bro. Once in custody, Arroyo's demeanor shifted as she made several incriminating admissions spontaneously. Through the fire, through the fire. He can record studio quality vocals in the comfort of your own home. If you're a singer and you want to edit and produce your vocals, you're listening to the best music. Yeah, that's your song. Subscribe to Soundtrap Premium and download the Soundtrap Premium app today. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and as she made several incriminating admissions spontaneously. Heavenly Arroyo stood in a Fall River courtroom, smiling and flipping her hair as she faced a murder charge. When her name was called in court, the teenager's response shocked everyone. Heavenly Arroyo. In 2023, Arroyo, then 18 year old, pleaded guilty Tuesday in Fall River Superior Court. She's 18 year old. She was sentenced by Judge Rene Dupuis to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 19 years. No Sierra parole on that shit. How does a teenager end up committing such a brutal act of murder? While the Bella brothers sought media attention through heinous crimes, this particular case explores the dynamics of teenage rebellion involving a young girl and her boyfriend. In the shadow of a custody battle between Daniel Halseth and his first ex-wife, former state senator Elizabeth Halseth, now Elizabeth Helgelian, a chilling plot unfolded. Sierra Halseth, then 16, and her 18-year-old boyfriend, Aaron Guerrero, were briefly together before their relationship was curtailed by their parents, who discovered the couple's plan to run away to Los Angeles. On April 8, 2021, Sierra and Aaron prepared for a violent act by purchasing a circular saw, saw blades, bleach, lighter fluid, gloves, and a drop cloth from stores near Daniel Halseth's home. The next day, Halseth's brutally mutilated body was found in his garage, with an autopsy revealing over 70 stab wounds to his head, neck, and torso. Further horror was added as his remains stuffed into a sleeping bag were set ablaze, leaving his body charred from head to toe. The couple's brazenness extended beyond the murder. They uploaded a video to YouTube, stunning viewers. In a shocking declaration, Guerrero announced, Their run from justice was short-lived as they were apprehended in Salt Lake City shortly after the video went live. On May 26, 2022, Guerrero and Sierra Halseth faced the consequences of their actions, pleading guilty to nine counts, including murder, arson, and robbery. Both were sentenced to 22 years to life in prison, with the possibility of parole. At the sentencing, Sierra offered no apology, while Guerrero did. Roxana Sikorsky in a case that gripped the suburban community of Plymouth, Michigan, 15-year-old Roxana Sikorsky and her adult boyfriend faced severe charges for conspiring to murder her family. The story of Roxana Sikorsky is a tragic one, beginning with her adoption from Poland at the age of four, along with her two siblings by the Sikorsky family. Early abuse led to a diagnosis of reactive attachment disorder for Roxana, a condition that made it difficult for her to form emotional bonds with her caregivers. At the age of 15, in October 2014, Roxana's life took a dark turn under the influence of her 23-year-old boyfriend, Michael Rivera. Rivera, who was much older, manipulated Roxana Wait, and hatched a plan to murder Paul Rivera. Roxana's life took a dark turn under the influence of her 23-year-old boyfriend, 23 Michael years Rivera. Old? Rivera, and who she's was what? much older, manipulated it's Roxana 15. and hatched a plan to murder her family members who were against their relationship. He went so far as to send Roxana detailed instructions on how to carry out the killings, including a medical diagram to ensure she targeted vital areas. <sighs> that night, 
night, Roxana attacked her younger brother with a fillet knife, aiming for his neck, but thankfully, he survived. Her sister's screams alerted the parents, and Roxana fled the scene, escaping through a window. She met up with Rivera, and they hid in southwest Detroit, but were soon found by the police. Due to the premeditated nature of her actions, prosecutors charged Roxana as an adult. In March 2016, a Detroit court sentenced her to 10 to 20 years in prison for the conspiracy to kill her family, while Rivera received a life sentence in 2015. Roxana's parents were devastated by the court's decision. They didn't believe she truly intended to harm them, and felt she was coerced into accepting the plea deal without their input. Roxana's mother, Lorraine Sikorsky, voiced her distress. She's in desperate need of continued psychological help. She is still fragile, and an adult prison would shatter her delicate world. How will sentencing her as an adult help her? Is this justice? Roxana nah, also help, shared bro. her side of the story. Ego, cut like a, just like a tummy. Um, what do you mean? He goes, I'm a man. He sends me an ordering picture. And it's like right over here where you do that. Eric Smith. This is the case that made national headlines in the United States. Oh, it's okay, Shit. Mom. I'll go by myself. Were the last words Doreen Roby heard from her four-year-old son, Derek Roby. Let's take a closer look at this notorious case. On a seemingly ordinary summer day, August 2nd, 1993, the tranquility of Savona, New York, was shattered by a devastating... Niggas is crazy, bro! 93, the tranquility of Savona, New York, was shattered by a devastating act of violence. 13-year-old Eric Smith encountered and this four-year-old kids. Derek Roby, who was on route to a summer camp at yeah. the local park. In a sinister turn, Smith lured the young like he into a secluded well. wooded area under the guise of showing him a shortcut. There, he mercilessly ended the young boy's life by first strangling him until he passed out, and then by dropping a large rock on his head. He then took Kool-Aid from Robbie's lunchbox and poured it into Robbie's open wounds. Later that day, the reality <laughs> What? That nigga put He put Kool-Aid on the wounds? The dark tragedy unfolded when Derek's mother arrived at the wood. park to pick That's him up, great. only to discover that he had never made it to camp. Hours later, searchers discovered Derek's body in the woods, only yards from the park. And with the perpetrator still free, the residents of Savona were gripped by fear for the safety of their own children. Who knew it was a seemingly innocent-looking Eric Smith? By August 8th, overwhelmed by guilt, Eric confessed to his mother that he had killed Derek. That night, the Smith family informed the police. This terrible thing was done. Everybody, including myself, thought it was an adult. How could anybody do such a terrible, terrible thing? Eric was subsequently tried as oh, a good parent, right? him as the youngest murder defendant in New York State history. During his trial, specialists conducted extensive medical testing, including assessments of his brain function and hormone levels, but found no abnormalities that could explain his violent actions. Court records note that Eric, often isolated and bullied for his appearance, struggled socially. A week after his confession, Eric was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced on November 7, 1994. At just 14 Damn. years of age, Eric was sentenced to the maximum That's when I was born, nigga. juvenile offenders of the <laughs> nine years to life in prison. Eric Smith served nearly three decades behind bars. During his time in prison, Smith was denied parole multiple times, with the parole board frequently citing concerns about his release into society. Over the years, Smith underwent various rehabilitation programs and repeatedly expressed remorse for his actions. In 2021, after numerous parole hearings, Eric Smith was finally granted parole and That's that, nigga? prison. Joshua Phillips. Growing up in prison, I've seen many dark things, and I've been to some dark places. Many times throughout this journey, I came directly close to ending my life just to escape it all. This is the case of Joshua Phillips, who went into prison as a child in 1999 at the age of 15 and has now become a fully grown man. His crime, convicted of first-degree murder for the death of eight-year-old Maddie Clifton. On November 3, 1998, in the Lakewood neighborhood of Jacksonville's Southside, eight-year-old Maddie Clifton was reported missing by her mother. Maddie had been playing outside her home when she disappeared, triggering an immediate and widespread community response. Flyers were distributed and search parties were organized, drawing over 400 local volunteers who tirelessly searched the area for any sign of the missing girl. 
Phillips was also a part of that search team. That's crazy. A week passed with no trace of Clifton. Then, on November 10th, a startling discovery was made. The mother of 14-year-old Joshua Phillips noticed a wet spot on the floor of her son's room. Upon further investigation, she uncovered Maddie Clifton's body hidden within the room. Reeling from shock, she fled the home and alerted the authorities, leading to her son's arrest at his school mere hours later. And within hours after being arrested, he confessed to the murder. I have to warn you that the following details of Maddie's murder are disturbing. Viewer's discretion is advised. On November 3rd, 1998, a tragic sequence of events took place that changed the lives of Joshua Phillips and others around him. According to Phillips, eight-year-old Maddie Clifton came over to his house to play baseball. Phillips, who knew he wasn't allowed to have, Friends over while his parents were away agreed to play. The game took a catastrophic turn when Phillips accidentally hit Clifton in the eye with the baseball, causing her a significant injury. Panicked and fearful of his father's reaction, his father had a history of alcoholism and was strict. Phillips dragged Clifton inside his house in a misguided attempt to manage the situation. Once inside, Phillips's panic escalated. To silence Clifton's cries, he hit her with the baseball bat. He then hit her under the base of his bed and tried to act normally when his father came home. Realizing later that Clifton was still alive and hearing her moans, Phillips's response was drastic and fatal. He further attacked Clifton, cutting her throat and stabbing her chest multiple times with a knife from a Leatherman tool, ultimately leading to her death. Also, he was using air fresheners to mask the smell of the rotting body. Following the murder of eight-year-old Maddie Clifton, 15-year-old Joshua Phillips was charged as an adult with first-degree murder and sentenced to life without parole, avoiding the death penalty due to his age. As of the latest updates, Joshua Phillips, now aged 40, remains incarcerated at the Cross City Correctional Institution. Thanks for watching this video. Check out the on-screen cards now for more stories. It's time to start my second life! I'm not gonna lie, these shits are like fucking crazy, bro. These shits are worse than the scary videos, bro. Nah, for real, bro. Cause you actually seen shit where people act like, bro. So he accidentally hit her in the head, and he was scared where his dad, how his dad gonna react. So he just killed her ass instead. And then she was still alive. After he fucking hit her and they were dead for that. This is this is sad, bro. This is just sad and crazy. This is insane, bro. Kids, bro. Kids. Oh, These are kids, bro. That's what I'm saying. Like, bro, I, it's kind of scary, bro. Like a kid be thinking of all this shit. Like, uh, fuck this. Hey, man. That's it for this video, man. Let us know y'all opinion in the comment section, man. What do y'all think? What's y'all opinion on this? Uh, and let us know if you guys enjoyed these videos. Uh, you don't want to see more. Can go check it out. And thank God for tuning in. Please don't forget to like, share, subscribe. subscribe new. God loves you. God bless you. And we be out of here. That's crazy.